Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I'm here with Dr. Gordon Newfeld. He's a psychologist, uh, founder of the Nuffield, uh, Newfeld Institute, a chocolate lover, I discovered <laughs> before we came on, and yes. the author of, of, of this book, uh, Hold On to Your Kids, uh, co authored with uh, Gabor Mate. For those who are familiar, he's somewhat of an icon in the kind of trauma recovery space. I'm so very excited to have you on. Uh, found you through your connection with Gabor Mate. Uh, and uh, this, this subject is, is dear to my heart. I've got two kids, four year old mm. twin boys, myself. Uh, so, yeah, of, of particular interest. Um, so, Gordon, welcome to the show. I'm pleased to be here, Richard. And thank you, you told me, no, thank you. And you told me you were intrigued uh, by the title of the show being human. And we'll, we'll get into that. I also just want to explain why we've got Suzanne with us today. Um, so Suzanne Banks is the, I suppose, hostess of the co-working, is that right? Of the co-working space that I'm currently in right now and record a lot of the podcast from. It so happens that many of the themes in your book, Gordon, are highly pertinent uh, for Suzanne right now in her life. Um, so maybe we should pass over to Suzanne just to, for you to give a brief intro of, of why you've become part of today's podcast. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Gordon. So, yeah. So um, I, I've got three children. I've got two grown up boys. I say grown up, 23 and 24. Mm. Um, absolute delight. Have um, yeah, been delightful children, never brought trouble to the door, never been rude or cheeky, very well mannered and very polite. And then I have a 13 year old daughter who is um, something else, really, like something mm. I've never experienced in my whole life. Uh, mm. Almost 48 years of my life, I've never, nobody ever told me what having a daughter would be like. Mm. Um, not even my own folks. So, yes, yeah, so it would be good to listen to you, chat to you and get well, some. We'll get to know her a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and see if any of the, you know, any of the things that I have to say or, or share with Richard uh, are pertinent yeah. uh, to the situation. So, thanks for your willingness to be part of this. Uh, Richard just introduced me to her just at, at two minutes before she got to introduce herself. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to, to exploring more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. So one of the things that you remarked on before we came on, Gordon, was the title of the show, uh, Being Human. Yeah, what does, what, does, what does that title evoke for you? What does being human mean for you? Well, it, 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 it's been my life study, really. Uh, what is the essence of being human and humane? Uh, since I'm a developmentalist, is, is how do we get to be truly human and humane? Uh, the, the title intrigues me, of, of course, as, as uh, at first you would just say, of course, you know, we're human. And, 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 and that just camouflages how difficult it is to be human. How absolutely difficult and how difficult it is to be fully human, to be able to realize our potential. As a developmentalist, I'm, I'm all about the realization of our full potential, not our full potential as Richard or, or as Suzanne or as Gordon as individuals, but our full potential as, as humans. How, how, do we, how do we come to realize it? And... Uh, after I, I suppose it is now, I'm, I'm 75, so I have to do the math all the time. But, uh, you know, after, uh, you know, 50 years of, of study and private practice and so on, I, I, if, if it would come down to a word, it would be surprisingly feelings. Feelings are way, what make us truly human and truly humane, but it is a whole story of development. We need to feel. It's difficult to feel. Our suffering is in our feelings. Uh, we, we have difficulty with our feelings. We medicate ourselves against our feelings. And, all, and uh, feelings interfere with our ability to perform, especially in wounding situations and all of these things. So it's, it's in the end been a study of feelings and, and, and the conditions that are necessary for us to feel the kind of feelings that, uh, that we need to to become truly human and humane. 
And I, like most everybody else at the beginning, confused feelings with emotions. And that was a big mistake, is that I assumed that where you could see the evidence of emotion, you there was feeling. And that brings up a really interesting point, is that it is that as as therapists, we pride ourselves in our empathy. However, empathy, if we go to the original meaning, and you may be fully aware of this, but his original meaning is to pro, is to project feelings where none exist. Right. Which is exactly the exactly the opposite of what people think. Uh, it, it came out of Germany and it was in the art world and you projected feelings into your art to make it more interesting for people and so on. So you project feelings where none exist. And that was the root, the root of the word. Well, it turns out that we that's what we have been doing for <coughs> decades, generations as therapists is projecting feelings where none exist. And so blinding us to the actual fact that we as humans, we're losing our feelings and children are losing their feelings in spades. Very emotional, very reactive, but they're not feeling what they need to feel to become truly human and humane and to enter their full development. Well, that's the digest version, but since you asked, uh, you know, that uh, the so becoming human has very, or being human, has very special meaning to me. Of course, Carl Rogers, the great, uh, the great developmentalist, uh, turned that uh, it, it phrase on its head, and it was becoming human. And so he actually, uh, you know, and truncated to simply becoming. And, and so th that uh, that got to the very essence. And if you reread his work with this understanding, you realize, oh my goodness, it was all about feeling something that we've eclipsed. You know, with John Locke. 400 years ago, we decided that emotions were the enemy, the problem with women and children where they were too emotional, you know, and, and so, you know, the good thing about men is they didn't feel, you know, we were just supposed to think with our head And uh, after 400 years of, of uh, throwing, uh, throwing not only emotion under the bus, but with it, feelings and everything else, you know, we've got ourselves into a lot of trouble. Brilliant. Well, thank you. And I get the, the first thing it feels like we ought to unpack is what is the difference between between emotions and, and feelings? Oh, well, yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. And it, it, it probably, first of all, when you think of the phrase, uh, to be able to feel your emotion, you, you realize that it has to be two different things if you can say that. Yeah. And, and so, first of all, uh, the easiest thing is to divorce feeling from emotion altogether and say there's lots of things we feel. No, uh, you may be very tired right now, but it's unlikely, Richard, that you would feel your tiredness because you're at work. Most of us don't feel tired at work. We feel exhausted as soon as we get our feelings back and we can feel it. You may, you, you may be hungry right now, but you, may, you probably won't feel it. Uh, you could have some aches and pains, but you probably won't feel it. I feel very little. People always ask me when I was uh, speaking and performing sometimes in front of thousands of people, Know, how are you feeling? <laughs> and the answer is, thank thankfully, I don't feel a thing. <laughs> you know, if I did, I would be able to do this. I don't feel that's the key to any performance is feelings don't get in the way. And it's actually what the stress response is. The thing is, is we can be full of emotions and not feel them at all. In fact, if if we actually put the formula of stress in, in fact, the formula of virtually every trouble we have as humans that is a lasting kind of trouble, the equation would be more emotion and less feeling. So I can be very frustrated, uh, very alarmed, but if I don't feel that alarm, my it is doing something in my body, it is doing something to my behavior, but I don't feel it. And, and in not feeling it, I don't have a chance to take up a relationship with it. It doesn't grow me up. There's all kinds of things that happen. So that differentiation and today's neuroscience is all about that differentiation. That is effective neuroscience is that that's the starting point. And that actually is the correction of uh, hundreds of years of misthinking about it. Right. 
So it's it's a feeling is is the bridge. It's the connection to. <laughs> The, That's a good word to use. Feeling is a connective tissue. It helps connect us to the event, connect us to uh, to our, our own emotion. Emotion moves us. Instinct drives us. But do we feel what is moving us? The feeling is one or two. Actually, it's actually two or three steps removed. It has to be interpreted by by the cerebral cortex. It has to link uh, the event, the situation. So feelings are a bit of a complicated affair. They're easily lost. They're hard to, uh, you know, to uh, often to to realize. There's a whole developmental process around it, where children come to have feelings. They they are born with lots of emotion, but it takes a while for them to feel their emotions. And feeling their emotions, they must accept that our whole culture, in fact, our whole medical system, almost every medication, the result of it is to reduce feelings. We have nothing to enhance them. And so we have nothing that we know of that it actually brings us to our full potential. Most of our medications, most of our help actually numb us out so that we can perform in wounding situations. And so we've actually been going backwards. We're not becoming fully human. Uh, there is a huge dehumanizing factor in this as we're losing our feelings. And we take pride in doing that. Children take pride in doing it. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Whatever. No fear. They take pride in not feeling. And it's, it's all over. They take pride with each other that they don't feel anything. I don't give a damn. It doesn't matter to me. You know, and so this, this whole thing has, has turned on its head. And, and it's running away from being human and away from becoming fully human. Right. And we celebrate it in our culture, right? That we, we don't. Yeah. We the, 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 the hero it. who doesn't who just. A, you off. are tough. You know, you are, you know, what a survivor. What a, you know, and, and we've confused it with resilience. We've confused it with all kinds of things. We confuse this part that, you know, I don't feel a damn thing and that that is actually the, the better place to be. And it is the place to be where we don't feel our pain. We don't feel our wounds, but it is not the place of being human. And so, again, that brings to the title. Is Your title is a beautiful. Like I could, I, you could spend a whole life unfolding it. And it's just it's amazing. It, it, uh, you know, if I was going to try and, and put a title on, on, uh, on my life's work, it would be something like that. So you've already stolen it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, and it brings to mind, I guess, even be before Locke and before the Enlightenment, the Stoics. I suppose you know we've got a long, yes, light exactly. philosophical tradition of, at some level, according to this definition, de denying our hu humanity. That's, That's right. fascinating, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's let's dive a little bit into the the premise for the book. I mean, the title is. Hold on to your kids, um, which assumes, I suppose, that we have we're, we're in the process of letting go of them, or we've let go of them, and, and we need to to hold on to them. Um, you know, why are we letting go of them? How are we letting go of them? And and why do we have a need to hold on to them? Well, it's 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 a. Uh, if anybody would have told me, I would have written a book uh, with this title. As a, as a young psychologist, as a young developmentalist, I would have thought they were crazy, that they didn't know anything about it. The whole challenge of parenting is to let go. Anybody knows that. And, and, and so as a developmentalist, uh, you know, the, the, the teaching has been for generations that, uh, you know, yes, you can give them a year of dependence, but then you have to help them become independent. That is the ultimate goal of life. And so the, the title was actually a confrontation of all of that. It was meant to slam against that whole mythology that I, too, used to believe and almost all developmentalists do, all young ones, I mean, uh, psychologists do at least. And, and, uh, and it was all meant to be a bit of a play on words. It only works in the English language, though. The book is translated into 26 languages. Mm, and not one of the other languages could, uh, could actually uh, use the title. Uh, because it means to grasp, uh, to, to do, you know, to do this. And in English, at least, we can play around enough with it to know it means to preserve a connection. It means to, that it's the adult's responsibility uh, to, uh, to, uh, to provide the togetherness, to provide the connection and, and, and to do this. It turns out that 
you know, after uh, after putting all the pieces together and as I was teaching developmental psychology at university and and it was just at the very beginning as a, as attachment theory was really becoming to be known as is, is when I would study these uh, uh, this uh, in the uh, early 1970s. It, it was just like, oh, my goodness, is that just like all other mammals, the whole issue of parent of parenting is to create the context uh, the attachment becomes the second womb. Uh, the first is, a, is, a, is attachment too, physically, but it becomes this, this second womb. And, and nature does all the work. If we do our job of being able to cultivate that womb of togetherness, of holding on so that nothing can, can come between us, uh, that, uh, which goes against most of contemporary parenting, because it's all about using separation as a threat about this. So but if we can do it, and there's so many different levels of this, nature will do the rest as it does and it has done for eons and in all of our mammal cousins. It does this. It will grow the child up. Our job is to not make the child walk on their own two feet. We provide the context uh, of, of connectedness, the context of togetherness, the context of proximity. Uh, we, we do this in this way, and, and development comes as a result. Just like viability in the womb comes not from teaching the fetus how to be independent and breathe for themselves, but in being able to provide all the togetherness there such, it, it is so that viability as a human comes uh, from uh, coming out of this incredible place of togetherness where I'm not having to scramble to do my own attachment work, but I have an adult doing the attachment work for me so that nature can get on and grow me up. And so that was the idea. And there's, it, 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 you can unfold it in about a hundred different ways and a hundred different meanings, but it all is a fact is that as parents, as adults, our, our, our job is to preserve uh, the connectedness, the togetherness, not let anything come in between, bridge all that divides. And, and if the child can relax in it, we all know now that all true growth comes from a place of rest, not work. If, we can, if a child can relax in that, take it for granted from the right and, uh, you know, uh, adult uh, who they can trust in, then it will unfold. And this goes against what was taught and in, in, in both British and American psychology and in Canada, we try to find ourselves in between. This goes against everything that was taught from the 60s on, is that you must never let a child lean on you too much, depend upon you too much. If you give it an inch, it will take a mile. Uh, you, you know, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you can't ever indulge independence and so on and so on. And it's very interesting. The research has come strongly on the developmental side. They, I'll, I'll just share this. They took two groups of, of, um, of, of um, uh, beginning toddlers. They, they literally toddling. Uh, and uh, one group of parents who uh, is, uh, is excited about this and are very excited about it because now they are independent in terms of their, uh, they, uh, their mobility. So they're now mobile, right? And so the parent who says, you know, when the child says, daddy, daddy, can you pick me up? Mommy, will you pick me up? Please carry me. Whatever words they can do. And the parent says, don't expect me to carry you. You can walk on your own two feet. And so that response to parenting, which is, which is, is still very common. And then the other response is, you know, says, come here, let me carry you and trumps the request by giving it more generously. And the research shows is the parents who are very generous in, in taking care, in this case, literally, uh, you know, picking their child up, carrying their child and so on, have children that are far more, far more likely to walk on their own two feet in every which way that means. Whereas the parents who are very, very, uh, very concerned about their children walking on their own two feet in every which way that means have children who have been uh, who get stuck in dependence, if not dependence upon their parents, dependence upon their peers, which is even a worse case, 
because dependence upon your peers is not a, a viable woo. You can't grow up from there. You get stuck. Absolutely. Right. And that's, you know, that's a central theme of the book, that this concept of peer uh, attachment and how deleterious it can be to maturation over time. That's right. right. And, and yes. I, maybe let's explore that a bit. And then maybe that's a good segue to, to bring Suzanne in, in terms of what she's experienced right now. But, but why is, I suppose, what's the, pe- the, what's the process of peer attachment? And then why is that, why is that a problem? What's, is it, say that again. Uh, so Richard, what's the what's process it? of peer attachment? Like how did that come about and what, and what is that exactly? And then, and then why is that a problem? Uh, well, the, it, it's very fortunate that we as humans can, uh, can attach very easily. And uh, um, we attach for two reasons. We attach to whom, uh, whoever uh, those attached to are attached to, we attach to. So that's what creates the village, right? So that's one way. Uh, the other way is that when we're facing too much separation, our attachment brain goes, this isn't right, this isn't right, this isn't right. We've got to establish a home base. We've got to establish connection and so on. And so when there's too much separation and, and because in today's world, we we farm out our children to be raised in, instead of raising them inside the village of attachments when they've been attached. Like I attached to Andy because it's my mom's sister and so on and so on. And so the village forms very easily that way. But when we introduce separation, the child is put into a situation where they cannot, they feel lost, they cannot survive. And so it becomes the top of the agendas of the brain. And so uh, the uh, the second way of attaching is through being the same as. The first way is through being with. And there's a whole series of attachments. And so the second is to be the same as. When we put two, three, four, five, six-year-olds together, in their brain, it goes, I belong with those that I look like, that I'm the same size as, that I'm wearing the same clothes as. And so they begin to, to it, 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 it's self-evident to them that they belong with each other. And so this peer attachment happens. Now, I, when we do the research, it began to happen uh, in the 1960s. Um, and this is when we see the first empirical evidence of this. But by now, uh, we have grandparents who think they belong with other grandparents instead of their children and their families. We have generations of peer oriented. And of course, this has given rise to the internet, to the digital world, where people seek each other out that, that look like them, that, that are the same as them, that are the same age as them which is against all of culture. We belong in families, intergenerational. We belong with those who, who raised us, who are meant to do this. And as a grandparent, and I'm a grandparent of six grandchildren, uh, my primary responsibility is to preserve the connection with them so that they have a, you know, an a additional uh, context in which to be raised. And uh, so th- this is, uh, it's very important that I do this and I and my wife do this. So we make a lot of effort to be able to make sure uh, we have three adult grandchildren now that are in, in their, uh, well into their 20s as well, uh, graduated from university. But we have three young ones, uh, uh, six, seven, and eight, and uh, another, and uh, so uh, we, we get to do this all over again. But the point is, is we become stratified in our society. And that is not the context in which we are meant to be raised. This, this peer orientation has infiltrated so that we don't even realize it's there. We're blinded to, uh, to, to it. But yeah. that's how it happens, uh, basically. How it happens is we're not connected enough intergenerationally. Hierarchically, which is kind of a dirty word for the UK and for Canada, because we love things to be all like this, all equal. But we have a hard time with anything that goes in a hierarchical thing because right. we, you know, we're afraid it's going to be abused somewhat. Well, it turns out that we require this. Uh, this is where survival lies, is in hierarchical relationships. Survival does not lie because our peers are not responsible to take care of us. Survival is all about who takes care of whom. And so the, it has to be aligned in a way that the care is delivered and received. And that is the ultimate flaw of peer orientation, is care is neither delivered nor received. In fact, it is a wounding environment. And so you begin to be defended against feelings of caring. If you begin to feel defended against feelings of caring, 
you know, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Th- then we well, whatever, right. That's like, you know, yeah. the, 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 the sort of the phrase, the, the that, emblem of the teenage generation. Right? Exactly. Whatever. And, and yeah. that's you have to. If you think of yourself and just think of yourself, I mean, you're you're, uh, you, you, you look relatively young, but it may be just because you're, you know, but if I think of myself back in high school, if you think of yourself back in, in this, and you can even feel the woundingness of it, right? How can you be there with your feelings, feel everything in that kind of a wounding environment? Mm. Yeah. You, you can't be, you can't function. It, we saw, I saw kids, uh, you know, who could not handle the peer interaction and they went down. I had uh, two of my friends suicided before grade six mm-hmm. uh, in, in the school that I went to. Uh, so everything pointed to, you've got to steal yourself. You've got to harden up. You've got to, you know, you've got to, you know, tuck it in. you got to hide it. And little do, did we know that the problem is that we were in the wrong place. We should have been with grandma. That is, if grandma is benign and not a monster. Right? You know, we, 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 we should have been with, a, with adults who care about us, where we could have our feelings. Then we can become fully human. We didn't belong in that place. Uh, that's a Lord of the Flies scenario. Right. We don't survive in a Lord of the Flies scenario. Right. Or at least you don't grow up. <laughs> no, you don't. Yeah, you don't grow up. Yeah. And I wrote, there's one pertinent stat for the book that uh, I like that uh, you, you, you uh, cite statistics from the, the New York City School Board, and they, they recorded 6,000 violent incidents, right, in the, in the school district yes. in 1993 yes. versus one in 19. 19- 63. So yes. That was, you know, illustrative of your point about Lord of the Flies. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. It seems to provide evidence. Right? And, and it's just got a whole lot worse. It, it has got worse. And it's got worse uh, as, as uh, uh, with the pandemic as well, is the, the levels of, of frustration, anxiety, and depression have just escalated, you know. Right, right. And the other thing brought to mind as you were talking is um, I dated a girl from Ireland. Uh, in my twenties, and I re- distinctly remember going to a pub in Galway, uh, and all of the generations were there, right? All singing, oh, playing music yes. in this one put, and I yes. was, I felt so disoriented. I, 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 mm. It's like I couldn't make sense of it mm. because you know, exactly as you're saying, if I go out and I go to a pub, or it's with you know, probably within a, a span of like five years in terms of age range, mm-hmm. and you're never going to see granddad at like the the nightclub. Right. Yeah, that's it, it, right. You're, and I hadn't considered that that we've got this stratification yes, at all generations, and we do. And, and the problem with the you know the grannies and granddads dancing together in the, in the in the local hall is you know they're not they're not dancing with the grandkids or, or the kids. That's right. That's right. And I, I talk a little bit about uh, taking a year out in Provence, uh, you know, the p- part of the world that escaped the Industrial Revolution. And we were in a small village in, in Provence and, and how there the traditions were about every two weeks, there was a fete, there was a festival. And, uh, but, but the, 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 the grandkids danced with the grandchildren, the, the teachers danced with the students, everything was intergenerational. And it was like, ah, oh, this is why you have been, you know, when we were there, Marseille was celebrating it's, uh, I think it was this 2,600 year continuous as a city state. This is, this is the secret to how it goes on and on, you know, it is the passing down through generations, but all of that is lost in a peer oriented culture. In fact, it's so stratified now, we tend to think of a culture of the 70s, of the 80s, of the 90s. <laughs> you know, it is, it's so stratified. That you you feel out of place when you're only one decade removed, uh, you know, from from others because they came out of a different culture than you did. Right, right, and then that they're not cool, aren't they? Right, that yeah, yeah, and not cool. And of course, it's and this is another point you make in the book. You know, the word you know whatever or cool, right? Cool is yes. not attached to my feet, not connected with my feelings. I'm cool. That's right. Yeah, it's so interesting to reflect on the language and the parlance. Um, yeah. 
So I wonder if now might be a good time to bring in Suzanne and for yes. Suzanne to share her story. Um, and maybe we can start to move on a little bit to, you know, to solutions. <laughs> but first sure. here, where, where Suzanne's at that. today, I'll, I'll pass good. the mic. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so enjoying listening to you, Gordon. Um, so yeah, so there's a few things actually, a few listening to everything you've said, I'm like, wow, that resonates with me. So there's a, there's a few things, uh, a few things I've had throughout my life. One is, um, I had my kids to give them wings. So basically go off and have the time with your life. Don't sort of attach yourself to me too much because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to be doing my own stuff and you might go off and have the best time of your life. So wings um, instead and, of the roots, yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, and also um, I've always said, and this actually sits true with the sex of my children. So I've always said um, females are complex from birth. You have to second guess us every second step of the way. Whereas boys are quite simple. Males are quite simple. You say what you mean and you mean what you say. Um, it's it's all over and done with. Um and I can remember my boys being at the age that my daughter is now. And it would be, they'd come home from school and they'd have had a quick dust up with their mates in the playground. And then they would be hanging out again together and it would all be really cool, sorted, you know, done and dusted. Well, moved let on. me make a comment on that. Yeah. Is that uh, we, we both have exactly the same limbic system, males and females. Uh, there is absolutely no difference to the heart component, to the emotion, to the affect component. The, uh, the difference appears to be rather ironic, uh, paradoxically, that males tend to more be more sensitive than females. Now, just follow me here. If you're more sensitive, you're more easily wounded. If you're more easily wounded, you're more likely to become defended against your wounds. As you become defended against your wounds, you feel less. Now, feelings are complicated. Males are supposed to be as complicated as females are. The fact is, is the easier you get hurt, the easier it is to feel. So what we've been seeing is more an artifact of a sensitivity issue. It's not really, and you'll know males that are incredibly complex and and profound. You'll know the poets, you'll know those very complicated feelings, but they feel. So the issue is in our culture, we both valued males that were less complicated and we didn't go out to protect them as much. We thought they could take a lot more than they could. And all of that has turned to be backward. So, yes, I, I don't disagree with your observations, but I would like to put it into a bigger picture is that this isn't the way it should have been. Males are absolutely, uh, first of all, feelings are complicated. And if a male, it, it, to the degree that they feel fully, uh, life is complicated and they are complicated as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so so going back to sort of similar age with um, the boys and my daughter, yeah, everything is very emotional. Um, I, I guess the whole feelings that whatever, I don't care, I don't like you, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't mean anything. What you say means nothing. Um, and it doesn't matter what you say. It will have no effect on me. Um, yeah, that's, that's a massive thing. Um, but also... She is very emotional in the fact that I just she she says things to me like, like you don't understand me you don't you don't get me you don't yeah you you basically don't know who I am as a person um, and actually that's really sad and it's really upsetting it's really hurtful and I it's not yeah, about you yeah 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 so it's not about you you're 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 the yeah. adult you're the mom yeah of course yeah absolutely okay? yeah and i i want to say it's a huge compliment that she is actually sharing those things with you i when you when you have a lot of feelings i don't think any 13 year old feels understood they don't feel known because the whole world explodes on them they have so much uh, it it is if nobody could even know them you know, you long for simpler times when you were a child So you could be the best mother in the world. She could have the best relationship with you in the world. She would still most likely say, nobody gets me. Nobody knows me. Mom, you don't understand me. 
Uh, you d- don't do this. You don't understand yourself. It takes years for you to catch up with and to be able to look at those feelings and to put the tapestry together. But th- this is not about you. This is about her. This is about the processes that she's going through. And so the first thing that you, you, you need to do is, is with your own attachment needs need to be taken other places than for her. Uh, in, in a sense, she is actually, uh, actually to, to be saying this and bringing it to you is a compliment. It also tells you, which is a beautiful thing, is that, that she still sees you as the answer. When she says to you, you don't get me, she's saying to you, I want you to get me. You're the person I want to be understood by. You're the one I want to do this. So, so I, 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 a lot of it for you is to, uh, to step up to the plate. She needs you much yeah. more than you think she needs you and that she thinks she needs you. She needs you. You are her answer. And so just giving room for this, if you came alongside those feelings right there, oh, my goodness, I, I don't know how you wouldn't feel that. I don't know how, uh, how you, know, it, 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 you know, anyone going through what you're going through wouldn't feel that. I'm glad that you share it with me. Can you tell me a bit more? What's going on? I'd love to hear from you. I'll try to try to make a time, you know, in the day or, or twice a week or three times when I can hear what is happening in the inside to you and so on. So that you're going to become the answer. She, she's needing connection on a very deep level. It's, it's when you feel it's a dreadful experience to not to realize that nobody truly sees you. The aloneness is acute. It is terrifying. And, uh, and so, but she's coming to you. And, and it, this, this is music to my ears. She's coming to you. Yeah. Don't yeah, take well, it as an insult. Take it as a compliment. Start yeah. right there. And your job is to recreate the room. You, you, you've, you've got to step into the place with this incredible confidence that you are the answer. Not that you have the answers. None yeah. of us have the answers. Parenting is, is if you want to lose your confidence, try parenting, you know, like you, 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 you can be yeah. competent at everything else and your, your child will give mm-hmm. you a feeling of incompetence so fast. N- none of us have the answers. The fact is we are their answer and your daughter still knows you are her best bet. And so she's coming to you for that, for that place. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. But um, and I just think it kind of happens so quickly, doesn't it? So, um, she she's you know she's been amazing. She's been wonderful, really kind, really thoughtful, really considerate, really appreciative. And then almost overnight, she's lost the ability to have all of those qualities, really. And and I think that's probably the most difficult thing. I can take the you're this, you're that, you're everything else but I think it's the yeah I think it's the speed in which it's happened and it, it, it happens from, quickly puberty goes, happens quickly yeah absolutely. Uh, and the, the the change of life and it's a huge change uh, the uh, the explosion of potential feelings is 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 huge you go backwards uh, in puberty it, it you uh, you go back as if you were a three or four year old, only one feeling at a time, impulsive, reactive. You don't know what, you know, what is happening. But again, it's important not to take this personally. It, it, it is important to realize that she's having some difficulty there, but she still wants you to be the one that's there for her, that understands, that, uh, that gives a bit of room for her, that cuts her some slack, uh, rather than who holds, uh, holds her... Uh, to the fact of being who she was, and she can't be that anymore. She has to find another way. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it is complicated for her. But if there's room, much of that sweetness will return when it is, when it is able to be, to, to be there. What you don't want her to do is start turning, so that, turning to her friends to be her primary uh, reference group. Yeah. Because because then it just 
you know, to the degree that girls are more complicated in, in their life, they also are infinitely more cruel. Yeah. The, the hurt, the wounding is too much to bear. And so, you know, the, the bottom line is, is she, she needs you. You're her answer. Not that you have the answers. You are her <laughs> answer for a sense of belonging, for a sense of understanding, for a sense of love, for being held on to, hence the title of the book. Uh, th- to preserve that togetherness, you are there, and and if you can, if if you can re re uh, generate that womb, so to speak, that psychological womb, you'll notice phenomenal differences. As as you, you'll you'll just feel the maturity, the leaning on you first of all, and then the maturity, the softening of her heart come back, and as the heart softens, you'll you'll notice it. Uh, she is able to uh, to uh, to respond in a very caring way. But it will come out of that place rather than pushing and pulling, rather than any kind of discipline. Discipline never can make a person grow up. Uh, it, it really comes out of that relationship with her mother. And, and you're going to be our mother for life. You know, the, the, the way you went into parenting is, come on, you guys, you know, get along, with, get independent because I've got my own things to do. That's not the way it is. Is our sense of fulfillment comes from being taken care of or, or taking care of, it comes hierarchical. And so the thing is, is family is forever. Uh, when a child gives their heart, you know, to this, our hearts are always forever. So we've got to change our thinking that, okay, you know, when can we retire when they're 18? No, 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 no. It, it continues on. And then there's a the grandchildren and hopefully they'll even be a great grandchild or so. But that is the context, and that's where most fulfillment lies. So it's completely different than this idea that, you know, we've got them for a few years, then they move on and we get on with our own life. Uh, it's, it's, it, that's part of what is leading to this desperate frenzy for fulfillment in our world because we're not put in a natural cascading care. Cascading care is a place that all uh, cultures that really worked where health is is all embedded in this cascading care. Yeah. And I think that the whole peer attachment thing as well is, is massive. You know, like we, I've always tended to have her peers to the house and we've t- kind of tended to have them all and, and all of her friends have been, you know, very welcomed and we've all got along great. And then all of a sudden she doesn't need me but she would prefer them and it's a massive yes. thing so so then all of a sudden it's like almost like creating her own little army of these people that you know that are my my really close group of friends they don't really want you to be in their circle anymore so That's i'm right. going to remove them from everything and i'm going to keep them for myself and also tell you that i don't need you too and i'm thinking wow this is it's like i can't she's just following her instincts yeah. Suzanne, she, and, and it's the instincts that are wrong here. And that's what I'm speaking to, this peer orientation. Like when I would do talk shows, uh, radio shows way back then, and, and uh, occasionally teenagers would be there. And they would, what's that guy talking about? Your peers are, that's the only thing. They, they're, they're like, oh, oh my goodness, he doesn't, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? And it was so self-evident to them. The fact is, is it's it's just like, I it's a, a kind of analogy I can use. Uh, I, you know, if you're divorced and remarried, and there's a stepmom and a mom, and in uh, in you can't be with both your stepmom and your mom at the same time. Uh, you you the uh, uh, everything is uh, uh, the the attachments are incompatible. Well, what the brain does is to hold on to your mom, it will create uh, uh, the dark end of attachment, the pushing away, the alienation uh, to the stepmom. Now, the stepmom thinks it is about her. It isn't about her. It it, it isn't about any of those things. It's a fact that attachment is polarized. If we love, you know, a a, a team, a rugby team, a, a a, 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 a sports team, we have one that we hate. It, it, it's always polarized. Now, what happens is, is when children fall into attachment with each other, 
if they can't be the same as their friends and their parent at the same time, don't feel like they belong to at the same time, just like mom and stepmom, then it then you have that polarization. You have that antagonism and you lose her and she's on the outside. And that's what I'm talking about in peer orientation. Peer orientation is at the core of tribalization. And you can literally feel it tribalized. Not only will she tribalize with you, but she will with her older siblings who should be her older brothers should be a great source uh, resource for her now. And all of a sudden they won't count anymore. And so that's why it's so important. Now, you can't reason with this because it's self-evident to her. What is important is to know is that it wasn't meant to be this way. Yeah. And it's important to know that you can get her back. But you have to be the answer to what it is that she needs. Uh, rather than like if, if you get hurt and you start drawing away because of the way she's treating you, it just pushes further into the hands of her peers. Um, a, a, a very common example is a Romeo and Juliet ex example, and we're all familiar with that. If it was just simply a love relationship with a romance with a family we didn't get along with, we've got a problem. We're going to lose both of our youngsters to each other. The more we alienate them, we've got to make friends as, you know, the Capulets and the, you know, you, you follow me. We, we yeah. got to build a village together to incorporate them or we're going to lose both of them. And, and so, th so the idea here is, is, is uh, don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. You make friends with your children's friends. You, know, you, you, you close it, it, it there and you make sure that you are the source of nurturance. Don't let yourself be alienated. Don't let yourself be pulled away. This is not good for her. It's not what she needs. It's self-evident to her. And in front of her peers, she may be mean to you. She may ignore you. She may lip off. She may give you the dirty eyes. She may do all of those things. But she's, you know, this is, this, this, this is, this is an, unfortunately another part of being human, but it's not the kind that is about our human potential. But it's important for you to, to say, no, she needs you. Yeah. you. You need to get your baby back. Absolutely. I, I do think that it, it is just a part, I hope it's just a passing phase and that it, and I do understand fully that she doesn't know who she is. She doesn't know where she belongs. She but where but, it, she but it isn't in. a passing phase, Suzanne. It isn't a passing phase. It, it isn't a passing phase unless you interrupt. This is the way the world is unfolding. This is why we have these polarized politics. We have tribalization. We're no longer hierarchically connected. It isn't a passing phase. It is her future that, 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 that she moves into. And so it, it, it isn't a matter of, 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 of something that she will automatically grow out of. We have to get our children back. We have to reclaim our children if we are going to bring them out of that vortex of peer orientation. Because as long as they're there, it feels right to be there. They don't see that there's any reason to do this. Yes, they may, when they have their own child, get feel a bit lost. And where's my mom again? You know, they may do this when they do. They may not. That's the problem with many of them. They are they or the, the, the families are broken and they can't get connected to do the job of being able to embed the, 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 the grandchildren is that, again, it goes off into into a peer oriented world. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. I'll keep I'll keep trying hard. I'll try. And, I, I don't know. I guess I, I don't know. I guess. How did you do it with your children? How did how did you get them back? What? I learned on the I, I learned on the first ones. And then yeah, exactly. I, I, I do tell it in the book. Yeah. I do tell the stories of the book. I, I lost my my uh, uh, we lost our my own two girls when they were the age that you're talking about your daughter. Yeah, I, I, at 15 and 13. And I tell the stories in the book about being able to get them back, a divide yeah. and conquer. But the whole thing is, is just not being reactive. If, if you do that, like, why would they want to be around you if you're not the source of nurturance, understanding, love? So the first thing is to get back to being a parent and, and so on. It was interesting. My the, the, the second daughter that I tell the story of, uh, she developed an eating disorder as well as many do because they're not meant to be outside there. You're, you're meant to 
eat what mom feeds you, not feed yourself. <laughs> this isn't very healthy. And we, we now know that. And but uh, she had developed an eating disorder. And it was just having a conversation with her the other day as she's, uh, as, as she's uh, over, over uh, uh, 50 now. And, uh, and so we were talk, talking about what was a very special place of, of all time where she felt. And in her mind, it came to the place where, where she refound, uh, refound me as her dad. I, I took her to a place in the wilderness where we did things together away from her peers. And, uh, and that's also where, she, uh, uh, the, where her eating disorder uh, dissolved as well. But it, wow. it does. It does take a concerted effort. It, it yeah. can be passive. You, you've got to say, this child is mine. This child needs me. I am the answer. I am the source of care, love, belonging. It's my r- job to hold on to him. Uh, I'm going to get him back. I'm going to get her back. Mm. And putting yourself in that situation to do so. If you don't, there's more to react to. There's more uh, language, attitude, stress. It just gets worse and worse. And you're always trying to, 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 uh, to get something through their thick head. And so it starts getting, uh, getting uh, it starts not going in a good direction. Yeah. And so you've, you've got to go the direction to, to get them back to where, uh, where the relationship is, uh, is, is a nurturing relationship. Yeah. And, you know, and I can see that's exactly where it's gone wrong, where, where I've, I've constantly been there and be yeah been been her answer, and then she's suddenly decided that actually uh, she doesn't need me to be the person yeah. that I have been. So she's turned to her peers. But take and- take away take away the um, the the language of intention. Take away the language that not she suddenly decided because this happened to her. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Absolutely. If you see her as deciding this, it gives her a strength and a power and a sense of agency that is not that this is a phenomena. It happens to our children. Hmm. And when we understand that it happens, we take a whole different attitude towards it. They are victims of what is happening in our culture. We're coming undone. Yes. And, and we've lost the rituals. We've lost uh, the, 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 uh, the things that have to do with our gatherings that support uh, long, uh, the hierarchical relationships, the cascading care. We've lost all of those things. You know, we chase, uh, we become materialistic. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so it's, it, 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 it's happened. And so uh, when you realize this, your heart goes out and you realize that you've got to, you, you, you've got to rescue her in this way. This is not a, a context that she's going to be able to be, become fully human. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks, oh. Richard. <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Th- thank you. Um, and that's something I picked up on in the book was this idea that um, it, it, these, these aren't your words, but the, the image that formed is it's as if they've been captured by a you know by another yes. type. That is a word you that's use. Right. And our job is is to recapture and that's to acknowledge right. this other tribe at some level is a rival, right? And, and yes, to right. treat it seriously as, as, uh, as yes. you know, as a group to, to deal with <laughs> yes. and conquer ultimately, right? And, and, and yes. ultimately integrate, as you say, right, into a, into a village of connection. But in the first phase, it's going to be about seeing them at some level as an adversary, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't court the competition. I think I, one of the chapters used to be, it's gone through various editions. So I have a hard time keeping up, you know, in which, which edition we're in. But yes, it was don't court the competition. You know, <laughs> don't, if, if you, you know, you, you, uh, your child needs, Needs, our children need us. Our grandchildren need us. Yeah. And then something I like from the book is that there's, a, there's an element of patience and persistence that's required. And when you, you describe taking, I think it may have been your eldest daughter, or maybe it was your middle daughter, away in the wilderness yes. and you took the week off work. You just, just talk us through the sort of evolution of the, of the relationship during that, that, that holiday, because I, I think it, it tells us something. Yes. Yes. Well, it was actually both daughters, my eldest and, and second eldest daughter, uh, uh, both daughters. My eldest now one works with me. She's a marriage and family counselor, works with me in the family in the Newfelt Institute. Um, 
but uh, with with uh, both, uh, I, I think it was the second daughter that was telling <laughs> telling the story that when she gets to this place, which is uh, uh, by the sea, and it, it was a place that, that she was familiar with from her childhood, one of her favorite places, and I chose it so to rent this little cottage by the sea. She looks around and she says, "Oh, Dad, this is boring. Nobody's here." And so I, I'm a nobody, right? I'm a nobody, and that's exactly how it feels. Is you're a nobody. You're you're you know that you're a glorified taxi driver. You're a you know you're you're a nobody. You're you know you write out the checks. You're you know it's just but you're you're, you're a nobody when they're peer oriented. And, uh, and it, it, it takes something not to react to those things and not to be argumentative and not to try to put them in their place and, and so on. Uh, but it, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, it, it was in, in that context of, of slowly going through. First, first of all, this was the one with the eating disorder. So that was a great difficulty itself. And and I made sure that the that the kitchen was full of the most wonderful smells you could imagine, even though she wouldn't touch anything. I needed to keep on making things and filling the place with smells and so on and, and have have that uh, around. And and uh, and I also made sure that uh, uh, none of the things that she could she could do on her own, she couldn't get the canoe out on her own. She couldn't do this. <laughs> she would she would try and she would come back. Dad, can you help me? You know, with the rolling hells and eyes and so on. Like the last person on earth, she would ever want to ask for help. You know, like okay, like get the canoe out. Oh, I can't do it by myself. The wind is too strong, you know. Yes, and so uh, putting a uh, you, you, putting in a situation. I did that with my elder child too. We went in a wilderness hike where they are kind of dependent upon you for just very simple things like food orientation, you know, uh, things like that, because that puts them back into right relationship. They, they you know they discover you as as the source. But towards the end of that week. She was right in there cooking with me and uh, tasting things and so on. And I knew that that as soon as she was able to accept the food that I would give her, we would prepare together that it was going to going to be better. But it it uh, uh, it uh, it was as we're going back. Well, d- Dad, I'm going to miss you. How 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 can we how can we do this more? So it wasn't that much of an investment, but it, it, in a way. I was thinking, well, how can I take a whole week off of work, right? Like that's horrendous when you're in the middle of your career. How can you take a whole week off of work uh, and lose my momentum, lose my pace and so on? And it was the best investment I ever made you know, yeah. for, for, for both of them. The best investment I ever made one-on-one in a place to let myself be discovered that I was an answer in very concrete ways to become an answer more in emotional ways. And, you know, and uh, in, in, you know, it, it, and I was known at the university, I taught parent-child relations. I was known as an expert. And that's, that's the insidiousness of this is, is that, you know, you, you could have written a hundred books. You could be this, it still happens to us. I still lost my, my girls. Hmm. I still lost them. And that is the power of the culture. Why? I took it for granted. I just assumed it would be, you know, be there. I gave too much uh, space. Uh, I mean, I I don't mean you have to imprison them, but the relationship has to be uh, uh, strong enough so that it, it, uh, it can hold on. Secondly, I went through a divorce and divorces are dreadful for children falling through the cracks. You know, it gives so much space and then they discover their peers and then they don't come back to either mom or dad. Right. And that's a well-known artifact of divorce. Mm. And so there was that, that to deal with too. So there's so many reasons, but, but they do need us. And now I get to be the, the grandfather for their children, which is wonderful as well. Yeah. Did you want to come in? No. Yeah. I, I was just, that that for me was a real moment of hope in the book was that this 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 journey over the course of yeah you know, as you said both vacations where you kind of kept the faith that was my sense even when That's they're right. still not wanting to collaborate they still want to do, don't do stuff you just kept the faith kept the faith kept the faith 
and eventually start to see signals of warmth. Yes, signs of that's warmth. right. You, that, that, it, that's a good way of putting it. You, you, you do need to keep the faith. You can't afford to start reacting. You can't afford to let it be about you. Uh, you know, I, I, you know if, it was, if it was a cult, we'd understand. No. Yeah. And, but it operates like a cult. It, mm. it, it's an abbreviated culture, but it, it just happens to them. But it, 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 it is this way. It's just that, you know, the, the big thing about attachment, the, the big thing that, uh, that, uh, uh, that Bowlby really brought out uh, to us is that, oh, my goodness, we had thought that just humans. Just Bowlby people who are not familiar with the reference. Oh, the, he's considered to, the, to be the father of, of attachment theory, one of the greatest products that uh, came out of the UK in terms of academically and so on, really put it on the map of, of this quest for togetherness and that it was preeminent. And, and so it's, it's changed the world all, all the way around. And, and, and so thank you for that, uh, Richard. Thank you for, for, for putting that in, into that context. And, but the thing that he said, which has not yet sunk into a lot of consciousness, and which is the most important thing to understand is we used to think uh, that uh, we had survival, we had survival um, needs. More than that, we used to think we had a drive to survive. It turns out we don't. Otherwise, would, there wouldn't be suicide. There wouldn't be all kinds of things that we see. We don't have, have it. Uh, all mammals, and c- including humans, we have a drive for togetherness. Survival is the fruit of it. It is what happens when togetherness is preserved, we are taken care of. Mm-hmm. And so our drive is for togetherness. We may need to survive, but we have no drive to survive. We, so in the pandemic, when, the, uh, when our uh, elderly are languishing in these homes, you know, are they trying to survive? No. All they're thinking of is being together with their loved ones. Yeah. It's everything. Everything is togetherness. That's, that's why the pandemic has been so insidious, is mm-hmm. that the, the, our co- most common need is this togetherness, right? And, and that, is, that is why when you bring those two together, you realize that togetherness, care, survival all belong together. So our job is, and that's why it has to be hierarchical and not pure. So it all flows absolutely from, from that place. And so that's why the uh, why we know that adolescents, young adults, no matter how they are, uh, how old they are, they still belong in construct of cascading care to care those who are younger than them to be taken care of by those who are responsible for them. And uh, and all all the all the literature uh, says that these are the ones that are the most fully human. That's where our. That's where being human is, is uh, really comes from. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned it in the book, right? You, you go to the Provence or where even in Africa, you mentioned, and I've, I've traveled in Africa as well. And I know that where you have these very close in, near intergenerational, intergenerational communities right. where you know, Western culture hasn't penetrated, you just see more smiles, right? You just see more vibrancy. Yes. They feel more, more human, right? At some level. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The, it was interesting. One of the uh, Margaret Mead, a Canadian anthropologist, went to, to a Bali in the 1940s, and she observed that the Bal- Balinese children were like none other. Their faces were open. They were full of feeling. They were musical. They were not, not, not like none other. And uh, I, I went uh, to, to Bali with my wife as semi-sabbatical and uh, had the opportunity. And they were still like that. But the one thing about the Bali is the wonderful hierarchical relationships. Everything is cascading care. Everything is involved there. And he said, oh, my goodness, that's the culture that, uh, you know, is the way it was meant to be. It's a, it's a Neolithic culture. Yeah, so you know that it's been intact for, you know, about 2,700 years or so, which is nice because you can see how it, uh, how it unfolds at the opposite of pure orientation. So you have a continuous 2,700 year culture rather than a culture of the decade, you know, <laughs> which is what you get when you get pure orientation. You know, are, are you going to listen to the music of the 70s or the 80s, you know, like in the or, 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 or now, like it's just all, all, uh, all stratified. Right, right. Yeah. And I guess that's because 
if you're trying to build a culture from scratch every time, there's not a lot to go on, right? You're not really going to get very oh. far with your culture, are you? It's, no, so it's got a dead end. It, yeah. it, dead, it dead ends unless it's hierarchical because you can't pass it on. Mm. So it, it, it dead ends. And that's, that's why, right, yeah. of course, because you can't, you can't pass this on to the next generation because you're, oh. you're uncool to the people 10 years younger, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's why, again, it's this, oh, my goodness, we've, we've taken a wrong turn. We've taken a wrong turn. And hence the book, you know, hold on to your kids, go get them back. <laughs> you know, this is your own fulfillment lies in this. Your own sense of well-being lies in this. Their sense of being fully human lies in this. You know, if we want to talk about empathy, we want to talk about all kinds of things. Uh, being fully human, it lies in this cascading care, intergenerational. If you don't have functional grandparents, go get some surrogate ones, you know. <laughs> Rebuild the village. You know, there's there's a lot of lot of elderly people around that would love to 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 have an honorary role as a as a grandparent. You know, or so on. We need a we need to stitch it back together again. You know, uh, yeah. to to do some stitching. It's it's not to say if if there's a lot of dysfunction in the family and toxicity. Well, you have to make a judgment call. You know, in terms of this, but. There is a lot of people that are on the margins that would love to have a sense of connection as, as somewhere. You know, we live yeah. in Vancouver, uh, so it's a very urban. I mean, nothing like London, of course, but very urban. And on our block, we had this, uh, I think I speak to her about her in the book. We had the, this, these grandparents who had raised their own children that were there. And it was like everyone on the block used them as surrogate grandparents. And, and it brought them a relationship of being like cousins rather than, you know, like, like a, a, in competition. Yeah. It was great. And this was in an urban, urban setting, you know, in the middle of a city. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what's coming to mind here is because the, the way I read the book is that you know, the question I ask myself is, you know, how can I be a better parent? How can I do differently with my parents now? Right. My kids are very young. They're four. They're still, I believe, primarily parent attached, right? Fingers crossed. And so yeah. it's okay, a question of me holding on to that. Um, but it's not just about me as a parent. What we're talking about here is That's culture right. wide as well. And it's like, exactly. how do we also encourage yeah. a shift in culture, which hopefully oh, this podcast is part of that contribution, but yes. it, it's, yes. it's, it's a much broader question, you know, than, yeah. than what parents can do, right? Although that's exactly. perhaps a primarily que primary, prim primary question, but it's it's broader. Yeah. Well, in in fact, what Richard, this uh, the book was not not written initially as a parenting book. The the book was written uh, to uh, to reveal this uh, this aberrant attachment phenomena, this peer orientation, and the implications of it. Uh, the social, cultural uh, orientations and so on. But as publishing industry goes, uh, you know, you had to choose which way you went. And, uh, and so then as they pushed it into uh, a, a where, where do you want to make a difference? Well, obviously in parenting, okay, then we need to add. And so then that's when the how-to chapters were added. They weren't there actually in the, in the start. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I was also suggesting, I was also reflecting on the fact that's also the way I read it. Like my frame is, and I think that was my reflection was that's part of this stratification, right? Is that my, that's right. my, my orientation to the book is how do I manage this in my generation with my peer, my partner, right? It's like, it's, that's right. it forms a worldview that's both sort of individualistic and in a sense, like pair, pair oriented. And I noticed that I'm not asking the question, how could my community be different or how could my culture be different, right? Because that's, that's again, part of the shift in the worldview is that we're not all just putting it on ourselves all the time. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, yes. sorry. And Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say, um, I, I guess I said that, you know, this, this thing happened quite quickly, but it's only recently that I've said, yeah, I've lost my daughter. And I thought before listening to, to you, thinking that I just have to let this happen and she will come back to me. I didn't realize I've got to almost fight for this. I've got to intervene. But when you say that you took your daughters away, that must have been blooming hard because Jemima doesn't even want to, she doesn't even want to look at me, let alone <laughs> listen to hard. me. 
and I and I literally can't intervene between her and her friends. There, there's nothing. Uh, there was absolutely I, nothing. And I had so, to give them an offer they couldn't refuse. Well, ha- I had yeah, to think a lot about you. that about what I could do. But no, you've got it right, and you hit it on the head. You actually, uh, Suzanne, you hit it on the head because you have this feeling that oh no, I lost my daughter. But the mythology of our day is that adolescents, we must let go of them, right? Yes. So you think, oh, okay, well, this is the phase. This is how it is. That's, you know, this is the way the world unfolds. Yes. So, yes, I must let go. And that's, that's why I try to just hit it right yeah. on the head, you know, Absolutely. like hold on is no, that's exactly the thing. It, 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 you know, maybe 200 years ago, children could move into the adult world when, you know, a, a couple of years after puberty, when they were 14, 15 or 16 years of age. But today, all the research says is that adolescence goes into the early 20s. And even then, it's difficult to enter as uh, autonomous beings in, in, into the world. So parenting is a lot longer than it used to be. I mean, the very active stage of parenting. Uh, not that parenting is, is, is ever over, but that's exactly the point that it was. Yes. Yeah. Your, your sense here. No, instead of letting, uh, letting go, being able to find them back. And it is daunting because when the peer orientation has become entrenched, they don't, they don't, you know, can I take a friend along? <laughs> can I, you know, Absolutely. You know that's the first yeah. question they that, ask. That is I'm the only going to go if, you know, if uh, Shannon can come with me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say it's very comforting listening to you, but also when I speak to um, my daughter's friend's parents as well. And so so the friends come round and I'm really cool and um, they her friends call me mom and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I have literally got the only monster out of the whole group. And then when I speak to their parents, they tell me that their child, who's so delightful to me, is a monster there. They believe is the only monster in the group. So, yeah, so (laughs) so it is quite because you can take it. And I think you do take it very personally. And and you just think, my gosh, where have I? And I've asked myself so many times, my gosh, where have I gone wrong? On what on what it's almost like what day did that happen? Well, that's, that's what my, my question was, too. Where have I gone wrong? And, I, and that's why I speak to in the book. You could be the perfect parent and this happened. You know, it, it is just the way the world has unfolded. When peer orientation gets that, that strong, it pulls them out of orbit from around the ones they need and, and into orbit from around the ones that, uh, that cannot take care of them. And mm-hmm. it is. And that is why. That is why we need to be proactive. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I, there's the, the only thing to prevent this really is, is to make sure that the cascading care is there. The, the, the uh, uh, you know, that is there. You've got, you've turned your friends into their aunts and uncles. Like if you, if you don't have aunts and uncles, you like you rebuild the village yeah. and, and make it very accessible. And when that happens, usually any friends they have who can't tolerate that will leave them. And yeah. so it is kind of uh, self-reinforcing. But you would have to know that yeah. to be able to actually create that kind of culture. But, and we also have an awful lot of competition as well, don't we, these days, with, dare I say, it, social media. So I think the boys, there's literally a 10-year age gap between mm-hmm. my son and my daughter. And um, and I, they just didn't really bother with it. It was, I guess, it was kind of almost the start of it. And there was that pressure. They were outdoorsy. They were boys. They, mm-hmm. you know, did outdoorsy stuff. Whereas with my daughter, and I've noticed also with the boys of her age now, so not just the girls, there's so much pressure from social media, whether yes. it's to look good, to feel good, to be liked, to, and sometimes it's cool to not be liked. And it's like, wow, that's whole Mm. different. And I think as, as a person, I'm quite laid back and I'm just, you know, kind of whatever, as the kids say, but um, with the whole social thing, I feel really guilty that I've just let that go. I've not kept up with it. I should have, it's a, it's a bit like, 
you know, giving my folks a mobile phone and they have it switched off. It's that kind of thing. Whereas with the whole social media, I've just gone, like, it's not really for me. I don't really need to know about it. Don't need to know how it works. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, peddling so hard to try and keep up with it and yes. try and learn yeah. how it works to almost be part of it. Do you know what I mean? To be, to try and understand how it works and how it makes, you know, not just my daughter, but all of her friends feel because it is, I, I mean, I just, well, I it just is think according it's to competition. Thing. The, the, the social media doesn't come from any anywhere. It's, it, these these digital instruments began with giving us access, universal access to information, instant yes. and universal access. It is it is the adolescents who turn these into uh, instruments of connection, and it's because they were peer oriented that they that they went to connect with their peers rather than their grandparents and their parents. And so without peer orientation, there wouldn't be social media or the social media that we have would would enable parents to travel and read stories to their children when they were home. It would be hierarchically arranged. The the social media we see has the shape of peer orientation. If there wasn't peer orientation, it wouldn't be there. And if you have an adult oriented child, they will not go. They will not be addicted to social media because it's unlikely un- that they will be finding the, the adults that they need to connect there. And if they do, they will look for more meaningful full ways. So social media is an is an artifact. It's a, it's a result of it. And I, I had to rewrite uh, the book, uh, two chapters at the end. I didn't touch the, the body of the book, but two chapters at the end, which really show how uh, a peer orientation, both so, uh, culturally, socially, as a sociological phenomenon, and individually, sets the stage for for social media. And so you can't. Uh, I mean, it's wise not to indulge it. Just like you know, you don't give them alcohol when when they can't handle it because it's too tempting, and they'll abuse it. It's wise to limit it. Uh, when they're young, uh, uh, f- for this very much so, like they, you know, uh, th- they need to do this. But you can't really once they're an adolescent, you can't fight it at, at at as a social media issue alone. You have to get to the roots. If if you can address the peer orientation, the social media thing resolves itself, yeah, resolves, and yeah. it 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 will be the result. And this is the thing that's understood: is people are trying to fight it at its level. No, 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 no. This is you know this this is what happened. We were going to invent a tool that could give us instant access, information, universal information. There was no question about it. We were going to invent that tool. The fact is is that we put the tool into the hands. Of, of individuals that we had already marooned in a Lord of the Flies, I'm referring to now, mm-hmm. scenario, we've taken the adults out of their life. And so now they re- use these instruments to connect with each other and social media was born. That's how Facebook came into being uh, you know, in 2005. That's how, how social media was born and continues. It's fueled completely by peer orientation. Yeah. If, if we address that, we, we take the 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 fuel away from the fire. I mean, we can't address it as a society, but if we address it as in in the individual case, in our families and our own children. Wow, my gosh, I could spend days talking to you. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. And do you know, I, I just personally want to say to you, well, well done <laughs> for <laughs> hanging on to your to your children. Yeah, it's um, it's blooming tough, isn't it? But yes. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. It's uh, yeah, it's it's not easy, but oh boy, if there's anything worthwhile, yeah, absolutely. You know, in this yeah. world, I can't think of anything more worthwhile when it comes to the, uh, you know, to to uh, uh, to putting it into perspective. So yeah, it was good absolutely. to meet you, and all the best in yes. your thank you journey so with your with your yeah. daughter. Yeah. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, ah, yeah. I'm just yeah. Processing what we've just talked about there. It's 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 uh, it's such a broad issue, right? I mean, I think that's what's come through again and again and, and re- reinforced through this conversation is that um, we're talking about co- cultural phenomenon. 
Yes. You know? and, and, and and social media can be made the, the enemy and, you know, Zuckerberg and the rest of it, you know, can be pilloried for this stuff. But yeah, it, it's much deeper than this. It's broader than this. It's a societal breakdown of some level. Yes. And that's, that's the, that's the challenge, isn't it? It's rebuilding. It is. Society, and, and, as you say, in and not to be a victim, yes. and not to be simply the victim of a world that's falling apart. We can make a difference mm. in our own families, in our own spheres of influence, in our own classes. You know that there's so much we can do. We don't just have to go uh, uh, along with what what is happening. Yeah, and and there's a ton of practical examples in the book like that. I mean, one of the examples I love is that you know the. Uh, people closing off the street, right? And, and bringing back yes. an, an annual street party, right? There's so many practical yes. things that we can, we can do, uh, not just in our parenting, but in our communities to, yes. to bring back this, this culture yeah, that we desperately need to be human. Yes, <laughs> to be human. Yeah. Yeah. So being human, so this is the key. <laughs> if, we, <laughs> if, if we provide the, the gestational womb, the attachment together, this, the context, that children were meant to be raised and taken care of, we have our greatest chance of becoming fully human and fully humane. So yes, it, it comes down to that. Brilliant. Now, is there anything you would have liked to have touched on that we haven't, we haven't covered over the course of the conversation? Oh, well, <laughs> is this, no, I, I, I mean, there's lots, but I've created, I, I think, 30 courses. That's what I offer through the Newfeld Institute. They can be taken anywhere from any place in the world. Uh, for parents, professionals, and teachers, uh, when I, I retired from university, I realized I hadn't finished teaching and I really wanted to be able to, to, uh, to create courses uh, for, uh, from the attachment-based developmental approach uh, you know, to, 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 after putting all the puzzle pieces together. So we have, uh, we have courses in uh, about eight different languages, but, uh, uh, you know, for this, I'll just leave that for you. Besides the book, the other thing that I've done is, is create these courses that are accessible uh, from anywhere online. Fantastic. And we'll put a link to the, to the Newfound Institute in the, in the description, uh, plus a link to, to the book. Um, Wow. Well, just, just leave us to say thank you. Uh, yeah, wonderful conversation. And thank you for the book and your, your, your contribution to this really important topic. Well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. When I, when I, it, 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 it seems to be getting more relevant, salient rather than less as time goes on. So I, uh, I, I appreciate that opportunity to, yeah. uh, to share. Thank no, you. And thank you to Suzanne stepping in last minute. Yes, we it takes a lot of courage. Before the podcast. And it was like, <laughs> why don't you come on the show and talk to yourself? Yeah. So thank it, you. It, it, uh, it, it hit me, uh, uh, Suzanne. I'll just leave it with this as I was saying, oh no, I do. Uh, is your daughter going to watch the show? But of course, if she's peer oriented, she's not going to watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> so it hit me as rather ironic, you know. <laughs> That we could talk about this here because there's not much chance that she'll actually she'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she, she'll, she'll definitely never know. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. All fantastic. All right. Well, well, thanks so much. Enjoy the, the rest of your day. Uh, fantastic conversation. Thank you.